John, do you think that the modern church in America is struggling with biblical preaching? Greatly. I would say, I would say that's, that is leading to the biggest problems that the church is facing. A lack of sound biblical preaching, I think, is the result of all the problems that we are encountering today. For example, we mentioned the fellowship a little bit earlier. I think if fellowship was actually taught in the importance of it, in how we are commanded to gather together, I think if that was actually taught soberly, we wouldn't be experiencing two-thirds of people having no desire to come back and haven't come back and don't see themselves coming back. I think that's a fruit of a lack of preaching on that doctrine. Uh, you turn on some of the popular preachers that we have nowadays and there's not really too much to listen to. They're saying a whole bunch of, you know, encouraging things. They're giving us pep talks, uh, but they're not expositing the word of God. They're not teaching doctrine. They're not, uh, as Martin Lowe Jones said, it's not theology on fire from the pulpit. It's just a bunch of good things. God's going to do this for you. You, you. you have a great future. And these people have millions of followers. And you look at the condition of the church, it's all because of the pulpit. Is It's not delivering what it should, the solid biblical uh, doctrines which instruct us how we should live our life as Christians. Uh, if you look at history, the greatest times of revival were men who were preaching the strongest. You had, you know, George Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards or even the Puritans. These were powerful men who knew their Bible and they taught sober biblical doctrine. Nothing else attracted the Christian other than the Word of God. There was no good uh, self-help seminar. It wasn't no pep talk that was being given from the pulpit. It was the Word of God and people were hungry for it. It seems nowadays that people who actually do that are not the most popular ones. On the contrary, if you actually preach sober biblical doctrine, you're kind of labeled as a dinosaur, as somebody who's out of date, out of touch. Uh, you have to wear a funny little coat, oversized glasses, and, and, and say how good of a future uh, you're going to have if you trust God and so on. Uh, you're not going to say what Peter was telling his Christians. You're not going to say what Paul was saying in the book of Acts. You're not going to say these things. Why? Because it doesn't draw crowds. And I think because the Bible is not being taught, preached powerfully from the pulpit, the church is in the state that it's in today, lukewarm at best. And I think that's very generous, even assessment of it. Uh, among the preachers, there are preachers who copy other preachers' sermons and preach it as their own. And this is actually a phenomenon that I, when I was growing up, I, I actually learned and, 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 and heard about this as well. Sometimes even pastors copy other pastors word for word. We know that is to be plagiarism. What do you think of a pastor or preacher taking somebody else's sermon and preaching it as their own? It's not even what I think about it. It's just... It could be labeled as dishonest. It's a lie. You're, you're lying because when you're standing up, you're preaching the word of God, and, you're, and, and people are understanding that this is something that you know, God has done in your heart th through his word, through that particular text, and you're teaching it. But when you're plagiarizing, using somebody else's sermon as your own, and you're receiving the credit, the God bless you, brother, thank you for the message. It's just utter dishonesty. It's a lie. So uh, I think it's terrible. Uh, and people who are in that condition where they have nothing to say to God's people maybe need to take a step back, reevaluate why they don't have anything to say, and uh, make some adjustments. I asked this question before to uh, a preacher that you and I both know, and he said, uh, and I, I still remember it, he said that uh, that's a sign of somebody who's dry. God is not speaking to them, right? They're, they're dry because they're not feeding themselves, right? And honestly, that's a, also a, a sign, uh, an evaluation on the preacher himself, right? And what do you think that those people who are in that state who uh, are trying to get by because they don't have that discipline to study, they don't have the discipline to craft a sermon, what would you think that as a, as a person who's doing it, what do you think that they should do? I think not what, they sh not what I think, but I think that this is objectively just true. They should take a break. Uh, 
because you're doing more harm than you are doing good. Because the thought is, is that I have to continue. I have to feeding. I have to continue feeding the flock. I can't. Uh, I can't bail out on these people. They're depending on me, and so on. And in that condition, when you understand, you have nothing to say to anybody. Your words are completely empty. They're dry. So you're going to somebody else's words and, and plagiarizing and preaching a sermon. You're gonna make it worse than if you were to step back, maybe take a sabbatical reassess some things, connect with God again, and, and come back actually uh, hearing from God and able to teach people. I think you just have to step back and, and, and make things right and then come back because you're not doing anybody any good at that point. And I think you need to understand that. Yeah, I agree. I think to your point as well is that sometimes we have to understand that not everybody is a preacher. And sometimes we are in, in certain circles and certain uh, denominations that kind of prop up that there's there's people, that men, that, that you're required to preach. You're required to say something. And that's not true. We see in the Bible that God gave people different gifts. Would you think that, that is that is that an adequate thing to also think about, that sometimes uh, we have to think that some of these people are not preachers? They shouldn't be preaching? Absolutely. Um, I, I could recall an example, a young brother, got an opportunity to preach a word, came up there, had nothing to say, um, you know, five minutes rambling on, I led to prayer. The brothers, you know, good job, patted him on the back, second time, third time. He continued in the same format, uh, not really saying anything, being very, you know, awkward and so on, not really feeding the flock at that point, and they kept on encouraging him. And I think that's dishonest as well, because you have to understand. You're saying from the minister's perspective that they shouldn't be, they shouldn't have been uh, encouraging him. They should have been had a real talk. Hey, you're probably not a preacher. Absolutely, and and that's not mean. That's not being negative. That's not being unloving. That's being loving. Saying, hey, brother, I don't think this is your gift. Uh, you may have a gift in something else. Cultivate that, grow in that, and be uh, beneficial. Edify uh, the, the church of God in that gift. Because if you're just not a preacher and, and you're being pushed out there and, and it's not being fruitful or productive, I think that's just a waste of time, everybody's time and your time. So uh, we, I think the preacher, the person who's standing behind the pulpit, has a calling, understand that God has blessed him, given him this gift. And you know, deep down, I would say that I know, and I'm sure you know that, you're called to be a preacher of God. If you don't have that conviction, if the Holy Spirit's not impressing on you and say, listen, you have this gift to teach, to preach the word of God, I think the preacher knows. If you're still confused, if you've been preaching for a number of years and you don't know, you know, that this is your gift, well, then maybe it's not. Yeah, I had a different mentality in the beginning. Uh, I would say that when I started out preaching, my mentality was that the more people, more men that can preach, the better, right? The more people that could study the Word of God and and and, exp and exposit the Scriptures and be able to teach it at a high level. I thought every you know Christ uh, Christian man should have the ability to do that. But now, as I grow older, and I even joke around that some people, some some men that you know they should preach, they should get involved in it. And now I have a different view because uh, I think that's dangerous to to suggest to somebody that they have the ability to preach or they can get into this. Do you think that? Do you would do you agree with me that if anybody is asking to preach? you would agree with even Spurgeon to say, listen, if there's anything else, do that. Or would you have a different view of preaching? Hey, you maybe could try it out, or what do you think? Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with Spurgeon. And um, reading Martin Lowe Joins book on, uh, on preaching, and, and he said that uh, you have to have such a desire, such a drive to preach, that if you don't, it's, it's going to mean death for you. And before, when I was younger, I would think that, well, I want to preach. And that was some sort of pride in me that just wanted to be heard and saw on the pulpit. And I viewed it negatively. But as I grow in Christ, and I, and I understand everything that you said, the responsibility, the accountability you're going to have before God, actually teaching people the, what the scripture says. Uh, the Bible says that. Brethren, be not many masters among you. Don't be all teachers. Don't desire this. Why? Because you're going to be held to such a standard. With all of that in mind, the preparation, the time, I have a strong desire to preach the word of God. I don't want to do anything else than that. It's 
other ministries are great. I'm not, I'm not saying that one is better, one is worse, but I just have a strong desire to preach the word of God. I love to preach. I love to preach. And I think that that's what happens when somebody is growing and preaching and you, you want to preach, not once again, to be heard, to be seen, but because you understand that this is the medium where people are going to be edified. They're going to grow in their faith and they, and those who aren't saved are going to be saved. You understand that God is using you in, in such a, a mighty capacity as to preach his word. That's such a, I mean, the Bible says, how lovely are the feet of those who preach? I mean, I don't really think feet of being lovely, but the Bible characterizes it and says even their feet is lovely. So I look at this and I say, wow, it's such a great honor and a privilege that God Almighty would entrust me with this to preach the word of God. I have a strong desire. Seems from what I've known you a couple of years ago, this is going way back, your view of preaching has completely changed. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Not only has your view of uh, uh, of preaching completely changed, so now as, as a pastor, uh, there's uh, there's one pastor that told me, and I, I I don't know why I think about this, so so maybe you can uh, give me some insight. He said, if as a pastor, he's speaking as a pastor, he says, if I was the president of the United States, he said, and he was an acting president, he was voted, and he says, I would be taking a step down from where I am. What do you think about that? Absolutely. There's no greater thing that anybody could do than to preach the word of God, than to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dying world. You could pay their bills. You could buy them a new car. You could pay their mortgage off. But it still pales in comparison as what the preacher does for those who are lost. He preaches them the living word of God. You are being used as a tool in the hand of God to preach the word of God so they could believe on the word and receive salvation in Jesus Christ. There's no greater task, there's no greater job, there's no greater duty, whatever you want to call it, than that. Everything else is second, third, fifth. Uh, to be a preacher is greater than to be a father, than to be a brother, than to be a sister, than to be anything else. The preacher is it has the the premise of overall of anything that you could ever do and i think it should be regarded as that the low view of preaching the low view of the preacher i think has resulted in what we've been talking about earlier the current condition of the church and i think if we got that in order too we would see uh, better results i've talked to you personally about preaching and i know you favor expository preaching why do you think this approach of preaching is more effective and more effective than any other approaches uh i watched the video and i heard somebody say john stop he wrote a book it's called between two worlds and he says that if it's not expository it's not christian Wow, that's a powerful statement. <laughs> actually, the Between Two Worlds by John Stott is actually one of my favorite books. <laughs> yeah. So if it's not expository, it's not uh, Christian. So regardless if you're doing a whole series through a book or you just have some sort of topics, but uh, when you're expositing, that really means when you're explaining the text, you're explaining what it means, you're uh, giving implications. Uh, I think that's the only way to preach. Uh, it should start, every sermon should begin with the text. Not an idea that you got, not something that you heard on the radio, but you should be inspired by the word of God. Uh, and I'm not saying that the ideas that people receive are bad or, or, or whatever the case may be, but we should be grounded and everything should flow out of the text. All the ideas that are worth talking about for a Christian have already been recorded in the scripture. We just got to explain them to people. And I favor that because it makes uh, my ministry so much easier. I remember beginning when I was a young preacher and I would be told, hey, John, you have to uh, you know, preach tomorrow. And I would be racking my brain trying to think of an idea or some sort of topic to preach about, and, and you're pulling scripture from here, from there, from there, and you're making the scripture, uh, you know, uh, support your idea, not the other way around. Whatever you have to say has to come from the text and has to be supported by the text. So when I, you know, was schooled a little bit in this, it just became so much better, clearer, and I would say less of a burden for me to come up with anything because I just explained what God has already said. So you're saying not only do you favor expository preaching, but you think this is probably the most effective method to preach. Am I right? Absolutely, because 
you're just saying what God said. You're not, uh, there's no man's wisdom. There's no worldly ideologies or philosophies because a lot of that is actually being preached from the pulpit nowadays. We want some sort of fresh idea, a fresh word, uh, something new. And these terms have become household terms for Christians. I don't want any fresh, any new, any hot words. I want the old, tried and true, the Bible, whatever the Bible says, that's what I want to hear. So I think that it's very, very, uh, it's fundamental for a church. If it's to grow spiritually, I think expository preaching is, is required. Uh, you and I have similar backgrounds on how we ha were raised, I would say, within the same denomination. And this particular denomination that we grew up in uh, really, really kind of, I would, I would say that they uh, strive on spontaneous preaching. Now, what are your thoughts on spontaneous preaching? Uh, do, do you think it has any place in the pulpit? Um, I would say that under very extreme circumstances or something that you weren't prepared. For example, I remember when I was in Honduras, I came to a church with two older ministers. I knew if anybody was gonna preach, it was one of them because they were the elders. Uh, I wasn't even thinking, I didn't even look through the Bible, I wasn't preparing because oftentimes I would, if you come into a church and you're a guest and you're a minister, it would ask you to preach, so I would be kind of preparing. But in this case, I wasn't. and they turned around to me and, and said, hey, listen, you're going to be preaching uh, for 50 minutes. So you're going to be having the last sermon. It has to be at least 50 minutes. And I was completely unprepared. I had no notes. I had nothing. And uh, I had to preach a sermon. I, I had to say something. I went to the Word of God, and I, you know, I preached the sermon. Was it the best? Well, I'm not going to be the judge on that. But if you're put in a circumstance such as that, well, then maybe, you know, I think the Spirit of God gives you an extra measure of grace to just minister to these people. But I don't think that should be the normal case. I don't think that that should be something that you should practice regularly, not preparing. Uh, I was reading in a book, and there was a man named Edwin Hatch, and he said that all preaching should be spontaneous. Uh, the preacher shouldn't prepare. He said that this type of preaching is prophetic preaching. This is what all the apostles throughout the New Testament, that's what they did. They never sat down. They never studied. They never wrote anything down. The Holy Spirit moved upon them and they began to preach. For example, Stephen or Peter. So there are people who do hold that view and it's very strong for them. And I say, if that's what works for you, if you're seeing fruit out of that, God bless you. But that's not something that I feel comfortable with because I need to prepare. I need to study to show myself approved. I need to rightly divide the word of God. I have to do my due diligence in order to, to preach. So is there, a, is there a time and place for that? There may be, but I don't think that we're, uh, or I'm comfortable with that. We have to be ready to preach the word in season and out of season. If we have to, I think a minister should be able to, but I don't want to rely on that. Yeah, I would agree with you. I would even go further to say I think that spontaneous preaching, uh, barring the that you have no time to prepare and you were kind of brought into a situation where you had to you had to, you have to go preach and the scripture clearly says to be instant in season on a season that the minister should always be prepared to uh, to preach and I know that uh, you were uh, as a as a Christian always in the Word and. Does spontaneous preaching have any place in the pulpit? I personally think think that this doesn't, because to your uh, statement to the guy that you quoted, um, the apostles and the time in Acts was a completely different time, meaning the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit still works and moves today as it did in, in the book of Acts, but we are not apostles, and we weren't uh, able, we don't have the ability to heal like they did, and God was establishing the church in, in as we know in Acts chapter 2. But I think it, it, it really cheapens the people, I would say, cheapens the pulpit when someone comes up and, and they uh, are unprepared, they don't know the text, they don't know the theme of the book. I was just talking to a minister actually today earlier, and I said, I'm not confident enough, even though I read my Bible every single day, a few times a day, I pray a few times a day, and I know my Bible, but for me to go preach without any preparation of the text, any real study of the text, real meditation, I would be completely useless to anyone to give any authentic 
uh, meal for someone to actually take to grow their faith. And I would, I would agree with you in, in what you uh, mentioned.